Welcome to Animal X. Our vision of the world and our place in it is built on the foundation that we are this planet's supreme beings. But what does this really mean? Are we the strongest? The fastest? And how deep can you dive? And how long can you hold your breath? They're actually able to look inside our bodies so they can see, you know, how excited you are. These fangs are as big as most Australian land snakes on average. On the face of it, humanity is not well equipped for survival. If we were pitted against the rest of the world's greatest predators, without our man-made weapons, we would be at the bottom of the food chain. Nothing more than a quick snack. But the difference goes even further than that. There are stranger things in heaven and earth. From the top of the evolutionary tree, we humans have always looked down on the rest of nature's creation as being nothing more than dumb animals. But are we really this planet's supreme beings? I don't think so. The animal mind is a fascinating and mysterious thing. Some have superhero powers, which we're only starting to understand. Surely you've heard the stories of incredible animal feats. How they use their amazing powers in ways that we humans could never even dream of. Some are powers of the mind. Some are powers of the body. And some, still stranger, are spiritual. I'm sending Daniel and Natalie on a quest to explore this mystery of animal superpowers, to see just how incredible these powers are and how they are being used to help humanity. But first, I've asked the team to check the Animal X archive for some of these animal superpowers. Incredible. I mean, whales can communicate over thousands of miles with just a single call. And elephants can communicate across vast savannas simply by feeling the vibrations of other herds through their feet. And then there's the dog's amazing nose. It's up to a hundred times more sensitive than ours, and it's so powerful it can sniff out almost anything, from landmines in the battlefield to skin cancer. And we need some pretty serious technology to do that ourselves. There are even rats being used to sniff out landmines in Africa. And can you believe in Britain, they're training bees to sniff out illegal drugs and other substances. Now it takes 18 months to train a dog and a handler to do this, but it only takes four hours to train a bee. And what about the little bamboo lemurs of Madagascar? Every day they eat enough cyanide to kill off an entire family of humans, but the poison doesn't affect them at all. All these mini marsupials of Australia that do the same thing with poisonous truffles. The poison has no effect on the little animals, but it remains within the body. So if a predator such as a fox or a dingo eats that animal, the predator dies from poisoning. Then there's the animals that save humans from death and danger. There's the story of the wallaby that saved a man from a house fire. 
and just as amazing are the animals that go on incredible journeys, finding their way home after they've been lost. Daniel and Natalie's first stop is Australia's east coast to meet some dolphins. Creatures that we humans believe are extremely special with an intelligence that some say is even greater than ours. We humans think we're pretty smart, don't we, Dan? But what exactly does intelligence or smartness mean? It's a tricky question. I think intelligence is present throughout nature and throughout the animal kingdom. It just takes different forms. In, in humans, we think uh, uh, a measure of intelligence is if we can go to university and get a degree. But if you think about the animal kingdom, they have the ability to communicate you know, with themselves and interspecies with all the other animals. And we're the only species that can't do that. So there's definitely intelligence there. I agree. I mean, when you consider bees, they have to remember complex maps in order to find the best pollen. And that's quite remarkable. And some people would agree that it's not humans that are the most intelligent species in the world, it's dolphins. Yep. And we get to meet some. This is the pet porpoise pool in Coffs Harbour, under the care of scientist Scott Taylor, who has been studying the intellectual ability of dolphins for more than 20 years. This is the first time Nat and I will have swum with dolphins in a controlled environment. We're going to be visitors on the dolphins' turf, and we need to know the etiquette. How should we behave around the dolphins? Well, the dolphins, um, like most animals, they're particularly uh, attuned to attitude. So the inner attitude that you have about them, if you appreciate them, if you respect them, if you take a sensitive approach to them, they will know that immediately. We're entering into their home. They're, they're letting us come into their living room, or really their world in this case. Um, so it's about, it's kind of like being a guest in a stranger's home. So what kind of behavior will we expect to see? Well, uh, they will have some curiosity about us. Um, they will be um, a bit wary um, because they're not sure exactly what we're there for. Buck, the oldest dolphin here, will tend to take a lead role. Um, the other two will be following him. They may come around and sort of kind of zoom past and give us a quick once over and then go off to the other end of the pool. They're actually able to look inside our bodies so they can see, you know, how excited you are. Um, if, you're, if you're quite calm, that's going to be very interesting to them because most people are very excited. Mm. Now you're interested in interspecies communication. Mm. How can we go about communicating with these dolphins? Well, a lot of it will be body language. That's going to be the first thing. Um, they want to see whether or not you're any kind of a threat to them. One of the strongest signals that a dolphin will give is if they form themselves into an S shape and pause there for an instant. They're saying, "This is my place. You, you know, beware. This is my. This is where I'm going to. I'm going to assert myself." These dolphins, particularly, are likely to come up and uh, open their mouth in front of you. Um, that's not a threat behavior. That's more of a, they're sort of testing you. They're going to actually are watching your heart rate. So they will see how excited you get, whether or not you get really startled. Um, your startle response will help them to know how calm you are and how much they can explore with you. There's been some talk that dolphins are actually telepathic. That's a big question. Um, it's been very clearly demonstrated that dolphins will understand what it is you intend to do or what we, you would like them to do well before you've even fully formed the thought in your own mind. Now, is that telepathy? Is there some kind of uh, intuition operating? Uh, we don't really know.
to communicate with us. I would say they're definitely communicating with one another, and they're letting each other know that it's okay. Uh, and we see a lot in their body language as well. They feel okay with us, but they're a little bit wary still. Often seemed to have accepted Daniel and Natalie into their home. But was there any interspecies communication as they'd hoped? Was there a mind meld between humans and dolphins? Really incredible. They seemed uh, particularly interested in you. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while for them to 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 get their confidence in us, but then all of a sudden the male came up and I didn't know what he was going to do, he, st he was just there in front of in front of my mask and then he comes up and he taps it yeah. and then swims away and I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> and then he let me scratch him under the chin, so do you think he was trying to communicate to me to tell me that I know you're a female yes. and I trust you more than these guys? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so, and, and certainly he uh, uh, he showed his trust and, and how um, how comfortable he felt with you. So the squeaks and whistles that were happening were they communicating between themselves, or were they looking at us and inside us? That would be a combination. Um, the the clicking sounds, uh, the very very high pitched stuff. Um, that's what they're using to look deeply into us. A lot of the whistling kind of sounds, um, those, that's a whole different form of communication and that's going to be more what's the, what they're exchanging between themselves. I noticed at the end I started making some squeaking and clicking noises back and, and that's when uh, they started paying more attention to me I found. It's like making some strange noises back towards them and that's when they'll come up and, and check you out. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, they're, they find um, human sounds to really not be very sophisticated. Mm. So as soon as you start being playful, that's why I think they really enjoy swimming with children because mm. children sort of have no boundaries. They'll go anywhere. They'll explore anything that they you know. And of course, children always get very excited and make all kinds of squealing sounds. <laughs> Intelligence is often connected to awareness. Like I know who I am and you know who you are. The question is, do dolphins and whales know who they are? When we have tested a variety of animals for self-awareness, we come up against a difficulty. But one of the generally accepted methods of testing self-awareness is what's called a mirror test. And that's the ability to recognize oneself in a mirror reflection. Uh, and dolphins recently have been um, fully accepted and accredited with actual self-awareness in that regard. They passed the mirror test. And they're the first creatures outside of primates to have uh, passed that test. So if the cetaceans are conscious, intelligent beings, how do they compare to humans? These, these creatures, you could say, live in a different world than the world that we live in. We perceive a world surrounding us of a certain type. We're primarily visually oriented creatures. Now when you deal with a dolphin, they have eyes like we do, with very good eyesight. They do have ears, although you don't see anything external. They have a sense of taste, but they have no sense of smell, whatever. But their sense of sound is like nothing we've ever encountered anywhere else. It is extraordinarily sophisticated. Um, they can emit sounds uh, that are virtually on the level of AM radio transmission. 
what they do with that sound as they receive it back into their very sophisticated brains and what they how they combine that sound with what they're seeing and tasting would give them an internal representation of the world completely different than ours it's my belief that that these senses do take them into a different state of consciousness one that has made them extremely wise I see them as the most successful life forms the planet has ever produced. Is it possible that they could have a greater consciousness and a greater intelligence than we do? Uh, they may have, in fact, helped us to become human. It could be that the earliest primates who were wading along an, an ocean shore or along the edge of a river near an, uh, a river mouth uh, came upon dolphins and found those dolphins to be unlike any other creature they'd ever come upon. This was a large creature, very strong, extremely capable, who had no interest whatsoever in harming or eating a human being. All they really wanted to do was to play. All they wanted to do was invite human beings into the water to play with them, to interact, to explore, and to enjoy life together. Well, what would that do to a developing kind of being that had only seen a world that was trying everything trying to eat each other? What a sense that would be. It would be, it would be perhaps that first moment of stepping outside of the self to reflect back on yourself. That certainly puts a whole new light on how we should view whales and dolphins and makes us think about how we treat the oceans and the creatures that call them home. power of the mind to the power of the body. Dan and Natalie are about to have a close encounter with some of the world's deadliest creepy crawlies as we explore the latest buzzword in science, bio-inspiration. It started when we first domesticated cows, dogs and donkeys thousands of years ago and then more recently with guide dogs for the blind. But over the last 100 years, science has been looking at various ways of exploiting the amazing power of animals. Even the smallest creature can have incredible powers. Like the bees that are used to sniff out substances like explosives and illegal drugs. The amazing thing about the bee is its incredible ability to learn. As Natalie said earlier, they can remember complex maps when finding pollen. Now that memory is being put to another use. While it may take a dog and its handler 18 months to learn how to detect explosives and other substances, it takes less than half a working day to train a bee to sniff out its target. The way it works is like this. The bee is strapped to what looks like a tiny surfboard. It is then fed nectar, which of course it loves, and it sticks out its little proboscis and gobbles it up. But each time it is given the nectar, it first gets a whiff of TNT or whatever substance it is being trained to look for. And within a matter of hours, the bee associates the smell of TNT with the delicious nectar. And abracadabra, like magic, you have a bee trained to sniff out the same materials. That means a swarm of bees could lead law enforcement or the military to bomb factories or even sniff an individual explosive. That's an incredibly powerful little army. Another incredible animal power that's being harnessed is the power of poison. Only this time, the deadliest toxins are being used to save lives. Animal venom is one of the most sophisticated bioweapons on the planet. There are two main kinds of poisons, neurotoxins, which attack the central nervous system, and hemotoxins, which target the circulatory system. But surprisingly, these deadly substances also have incredible powers to heal. For example, 
Protein in the Chilean rose-haired tarantula can be used to wipe out often fatal heart diseases in humans. The venom produced from animals such as spiders and scorpions is driving such a revolution in medicine that we are now on the verge of major breakthroughs in some diseases. The research has become so successful that 65% of America's top 500 selling drugs are derived from nature. We're in far north Queensland in Australia with scorpion and spider hunter Stuart Douglas who milks their venom and supplies it for scientific study. These are Australian tarantulas. They actually vocalise. They make a noise as part of their defence mechanism. And no other tarantulas do that. It's just the Australian Just the Australian tarantulas do that. And they are also the world's most savage tarantula. There are around 300 species of tarantulas in the world. The largest can have a leg span of up to 12 inches with fangs an inch long. The female can live up to 30 years, while the male can only manage around seven years. Some of these carnivores live in trees, others on the ground. But these Australian tarantulas like to live in burrows. Can her eyes see us? Can... Uh, they've actually got very little sight, but um, they've all the hairs off their back legs and all around their body um, basically senses movement and vibration. Yeah. Stuart is yeah, confident that the Australian tarantula Thanks. venom will find its yeah, way yeah. into modern drugs, just as other tarantula venoms have. There's already a precedence in other parts of the world where uh, they're already making drugs from tarantula venoms. As such as uh, heart palpitation drugs, heart arrhythmia drugs, and a drug that uh, slows down the effects of when you actually have a heart attack. Many of these amazing creatures are becoming harder and harder to find on the ground due to an illegal black market pet trade. But Stuart has agreed to take us to a secret location where he says he knows wild tarantulas thrive. You know, before they actually get there. Habitat. See, this is a, like a savanna type. Are in this area. I know there have been so Species. many that have been undescribed. Yeah. Completely different types of tarantulas here than you do in the rainforest. Yes, different sort of country. country. Well, there's a huge amount. Yeah, these paints are good. Oh. What's the biggest threat to these animals at the moment in the wild? Uh, definitely human intervention. But the biggest problem would be uh, land clearance, like most animals, and the uh, pet trade. So as far as the black market go, do a lot of the tarantulas go overseas? Yes, unfortunately, and I'm pretty disheartened to say that, but uh, there's people in Australia that are exporting these animals illegally because there is a lot of money overseas in uh, basically rare Australian tarantulas. So once you've captured a female like this one, then what do you do with her? Uh, predominantly use her for captive breeding as well as uh, venom extraction. How do you actually go about extracting the venom? Can you show us? Yeah, for sure. I've got a spot back up here and we can do a field extraction for the venom. So I'm just going to anaesthetise the little spider here. And what gas is that? Uh, it's just carbon dioxide. And basically, this is the most efficient way to anaesthetise them. So I think that's about enough. And if we just turn that off... Yeah, there's the full and nice anaesthetised spider. Let me put that... Pop so that. you pop the fangs over the vial. Position it, and then just give it a mild shock. So by giving it a mild electric shock that stimulates the venom glands? Yes. It looks very fiddly. It is. Oh, there you go. Can you see that? Yep. And that's Fagilis tarantula venom. As you can see there's two drops of venom there and that'll be used for biopharmaceutical screening. So is that an average amount of venom 
that this spider would use to inject its prey? Yeah, I think that's about the amount that they'd inject into a prey on them. See the fangs here? These fangs are as big as most Australian land snake on average. And you've been bitten by one of these guys before, haven't you? Yeah, unfortunately it's a lot bigger. This is a really small one. That's got to hurt. It does. It's about eight hours or ten hours of uh, nausea, vomiting. Don't like the sound of that. As I said earlier, Stuart also collects venom from another of the world's deadliest creatures, the scorpion. We may think we're at the top of the tree when it comes to being smart, but scientists are finding that animals have some incredible powers. Would you believe the deadly spider and scorpion venom is being used to save people's lives? Daniel and Natalie are in a tropical rainforest in Queensland, Australia, talking with spider and scorpion expert Stuart Douglas. So this is the Eurydacus scorpion, one of the most common scorpions here in uh, probably Australia, yeah. And I can just get his pincers under there. So have you ever done this on camera before? Um, no. Okay. So this could be the first time that we've actually seen a scorpion milked on camera? Yeah, as far as I know, it, it most definitely is. Now if I can get you just to hold on to this. Sure. And uh, we'll give it a go. As you can see, it's a very milky, almost poison-like poison. Yeah, right. And um, that's probably enough to make quite a few people sick. Now that's scary. And it's about to get scarier. We're about to go out on a scorpion hunt with Stuart, and the best time to do this is at night time. And the tool that we'll be using is an ultraviolet light, because it makes them glow. Oh, look, there's one there. Oh, wow. Yeah, see, bioluminescence. Of it. That's amazing. I never realised they glowed so, yeah, so strongly. Yeah, no one really knows why they uh, bioluminesce, but um, there's a theory that it, they might see in that spectrum of light. But if we to turn the globe off, and you can see, yeah, it's actually a black scorpion. It's uh, a light jelly, is this one. Although we're not sure why these scorpions are bioluminescent, it could be another power that could help science in the future. Oh, look at this. This is a different one. Oh, it's a beauty. This is a Eurydacus. That's different? Yeah, it's a different scorpion. Totally different genus. Oh, it's angry. You're pretty much right, as long as you don't let go of this talisman here. But uh, I, I might say, you wouldn't recommend most people uh, handling scorpions like this. Hey, see, look at this one in the tree. Look at this. Oh, this is a real poisonous one, too. This scorpion is ten times deadlier than all the other ones. It's a really dangerous. This would probably kill a child. That's something I certainly wouldn't like to come across on a dark night. Oh, no, thank you. But I wouldn't mind being able to scale tall buildings in a single leap. Or to hang from the ceiling by my toe. One man is trying to develop a suit that will allow him to do just that. You see, a new critter has fallen under the scientist's gaze. The gecko. If you believe that fact is stranger than fiction, bioinspiration is leading research scientists into the world of science fiction, where one day in the not too distant future, everyone can become a superhero. Professor Metton City and other scientists like him want to take animal powers even further, using them to revolutionise the way we explore our planets. The gecko is like no other animal on Earth. 
With no suction cups or Velcro-like hooks, it can scurry up and down walls and across ceilings, and even dash up smoothly polished glass with no effort at all. Despite a century of studying, science has never been able to figure out just how this amazing animal does what it does. But Professor Seti and his team think they've cracked it and are working on both a suit and a vehicle that can do what a gecko can do. So what do you think is the magic of bioinspiration? Why is it so important? The nature by evolution developed so many unique functionalities of biological systems. And as an engineer, what we are trying to do is try to understand how nature works, like in the case of gecko, how really they climb and use these hairs in their feet to stick. Professor City says the gecko has millions of tiny hairs on its feet that are invisible to the human eye, but which gives it the power to defy gravity and literally walk anywhere, anytime. He and his team have managed to successfully mimic those hairs. So these are the synthetic hairs? Yeah, so what we have done is we fabricated uh, similar fibres with our own fabrication techniques. And these whitish square areas include thousands and even overall area, millions of small tiny fibres or hairs. So basically I'll show you right now we can use these synthetic fibers as adhesive of gecko adhesive. So what we do is this is a weight, for example, this is 50 gram weight. And for a, this kind of surface, which is an aluminum surface, we basically attach this adhesive by pressing it. So this is like the animal presses the feet. And then you hold the adhesive and you can see that it can stick to the surface well and hold the weight. And the interesting thing is after holding it, the peeling is very easy. It just pops off. And this is their gecko. A far cry from the real thing, but it's getting there. So how does this one work? So this one basically uses the legs in cross directions and they put those two legs at the same time and then press them to the surface so that the adhesive material got stuck. And then the other two legs in the meantime lifts their feet up. And basically then the body rotates uh, the middle of the, uh, let's say, center of the body so that it pushes the robot body up, uh, let's say, towards to the vertical surface. So which is basically similar to the gecko uh, climbing okay. for flat surfaces. Can you see a day where we have robots exploring alien terrain, no matter what the conditions are? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, we have a project in my group that we are developing novel climbing robots that can basically access on any planet, uh, on surfaces, and they can walk, climb around, and basically they can search life, they can get fossils, and they will have different sensors so that uh, they can work in those very harsh environments in the future. Insects, they developed a special, or different special mechanisms, but not only one, to really get a lift for their body. And basically what they do is they flap their wings at very high amplitude, but also at very high speed, at frequency, so that they can flap very fast, let's say 150 times in a second. And when they flap it, it's not only like a bird flapping, they also rotate their wings, so they really make complicated shapes which generates some vortices at the back so that they can get enough lift to uh, propel their body in this very viscous uh, air uh, for their size. They are very highly maneuverable. So they can turn corners 90 degrees, they can turn upside down and uh, let's say land on a ceiling. So they have this amazing flying capability that a helicopter or other flying missions cannot have. And also they are very power efficient. So basically they use so small power because they have kind of a vibration mechanism that he's using relatively minimal power to generate those uh, motions. Uh, and then if you can mimic that or get inspiration from that and build robots similar uh, with similar flapping mechanisms, basically we will use very few power and also we will have really new capabilities of uh, high maneuverable flight. Uh, 
on Mars or on Earth. It's the, uh, all possible applications. And big advantage is those robots will be relatively small and very light, and we can have many of them. And if you deploy so many of those small robots on those planets, they will go around and find out these clues of life and send back to some main station, and you will find out, or we will find out one day, if there is life or other uh, kind of behavior in those uh, planets one day. Definitely it's possible. Fascinating, my darlings, just fascinating. And it all comes from the power of animals. It seems that the further we progress, the further we are looking back. There's much to learn from the animal world, and Daniel and Natalie are about to undertake another incredible journey. And this time, to discover a different animal power. The power of animal totems. So far, we have seen how dolphins may have a completely different take on the world to us. Being able to see right into our bodies, if not our souls. And talking of souls, it's time to look at how those animal powers work on the spiritual plane. We're about to meet Australian Aborigine Robert Brofo. He's going to tell us about the Woggle, or Rainbow Serpent, a snake that has mystical and religious significance for the Noongar people, the Aboriginal people of Perth and Western Australia. The uh, Aboriginal people have been here since the beginning of time. It's, uh, they've lived here a long, long time before the white man ever came. And it's our spiritual dream and that got us through from, from the beginning of, of time to where we are now. And part of that spiritual dreaming is the belief in the powers of the creatures of the dream time, including the Woggle, or Rainbow Serpent, which Robert Brofo says created the Swan River that runs through the state capital of Perth and out into the Indian Ocean. Water is life, and without water you don't exist. The Rainbow Serpent, which is the Woggle, it is called many things. It's the rainbow serpent and it creates waterways. Rainbow represents showing after the rain and when the sun comes out. So all those things link up to water and survival. In the beginning, the land was dry and the rainbow serpent, the woggle, he went in search of water and he moved across the dry land and he created the markings. And those markings became the rivers when the rain fell and filled up and the little creeks ran into there and joined into there, into there, into there, into there, into there and the water went back down and out into the ocean which is the grandmother of all rivers. That's how the circle begun and then the sun sucks up the sea water, it becomes rain again and it falls again. That's how the waterways has been created. I'm going to throw this in there to tell my ancestors I'm gone now. See you! Woo! So strong is their belief in the power of the Rainbow Serpent that Robert Brofo and many of the Noongar elders waged a bitter protest against the state government's plan to renovate an old brewery, which the Noongar people claimed defiled the sacred resting place of the Rainbow Serpent. Despite fighting on the picket lines and in the courts, the Noongar people lost their battle. But their belief in the power of the creatures of the dream time remains. And we thank the Noongar people for sharing their sacred stories with us. Daniel and Natalie will take part in a sacred ceremony as they discover their animal totems. Daniel and Natalie are about to meet Grandfather Michael, a shaman, who specializes in identifying animal totems. 
The essence of everything that I do is working with the spirits because the spirits, without them, I have no power. And it's taken me a lifetime of starting to understand what they're about, what they need from me. It's a two-way dialogue as we are here, as I am with them. But they have the greater oversight as to what path to tread. And so, like yourselves being here, Spirit decided that. And it's always a great mystery working with Spirit. There is no textbook that will teach you how to be a shaman. It's an everyday unfoldment. And the essence of working with Spirit is trust and faith. We're about to go on a drumming journey with Grandfather Michael, who's going to help us get in contact with our animal spirits. But first, we're going to sit down with his wife, Grandmother Marish, and she's going to identify our animal totems. I'm really quite excited about this. Grandmother Marish deals the cards and explains how the totems will be there to guide the pair. It's your drawing on their strength the essence of their strength because spirit is there to guide and help you and this is the strength of these animals. Totem is about inner strength and you connect with that totem then you're connecting with your inner strength and then you can work to those sides that are more powerful and positive to see why it's there and sometimes it can be quite unexpected as you'll find out later. My totem is bear because I've reflected it in many ways in my life as you're going to discover what your totems are. This is not something to look up in a book and say, well, oh, I fancy being that. The totems walk into your life for a good reason and you need to listen. So what kinds of messages can we get from animals? Life-changing ones. So before you ask, you better be prepared that you want to change your life otherwise stay in ignorance. We need to find peace within ourselves and we can see that within all living things around us, that they are at peace with their surroundings. Next, they take part in an ancient smoking ritual. I call the ancient spirits. All spirits gather true, gather here, for we are here to honor you. Let those totems come forward and surround them. According to Grandfather Michael, it's important to know your animal totems because you can draw power from them. Uh, my animals were the spider, the ant and the skunk. My totem animals are the dog, the armadillo, and the turkey. The ant represented patience, which I have sometimes, and I don't have other times. The dog is extremely loyal. We think of loyalty when we think of the dog. The spider represented the web of life and complexity. The turkey is very giving. I tend to be quite generous towards other people, but tend to, to miss being generous to myself. The skunk represented something that plods along and if backed into a corner, can turn around and give a nasty bite and send whatever's annoying it running. And the armadillo tends to be very stubborn and I'm very focused on what I want to achieve in my life. The totems according to Dan and Nat are helpful, especially if you work with animals. Well, my darlings, it's been a very interesting journey to look at animal powers. Daniel and Natalie, what are your final thoughts? Um, it was just a, a really amazing journey, meeting um, a lot of interesting people and a lot of really amazing animals like the spiders and, and the scorpions and, you know, to dolphins and uh, talking to even people like Grandfather Michael who told us about ancient, the ancient beliefs of, of people and the, the powers that animals have. And after this journey, Daniel, 
Do you believe humans are the supreme beings on planet Earth? Well, I've, I've never really believed that. I think that's just something that humans have tagged onto themselves. Certainly not. I think it's quite arrogant of us to think that we are the planet's supreme animal. I mean, all animals have their own unique, special qualities that enable them to adapt to specific environments. I mean, dolphins are amazing. The way that they can communicate with each other and even communicate with other species, I mean, we can't, do, we can't even do that. When you look into a dolphin's eye, and I'd thoroughly recommend anyone to do it, you can really see how intelligent they are. It's the spiders, the scorpions, and, and how long they've been around on Earth, and, and they continue to be around, and they, you know, they're very, very successful in surviving, and um, they've managed to survive a lot longer than we have, and not managed to destroy the planet. So, yeah, it's quite, quite an amazing journey. Intelligence is considered to be the ultimate survival tool, but... If the world as we know it ended tomorrow, do you know what would crawl out of the debris and continue to exist? Cockroaches, my darlings, cockroaches. So despite all our technology and our so-called intelligence, when humanity no longer dominates this little planet, scientists say the humble cockroach will remain because all a cockroach needs to survive is warmth, water and some kind of decaying matter. Stranger things in heaven and earth. You've just seen some of them.